Now, our, uh, Floyd here is showing us the general structure, how the rotor is free in the seesaw direction, and uh, what the general arrangement is. There's the throttle with conventional linkage to the carburetor. And that is the chain controlling the pitch of the tail rotor with an acme thread there uh, when he moves his left hand horizontally. And that shows the tail rotor with uh, quite considerable over design because as you'll see the parts are very massive. We later learn to make them lighter and uh, learn the hard way about fatigue failures in the process. This is still not considered a free flight because there's a man holding each leg and Floyd is being taken out to a tie-down place out in the meadow there. A, a new tie-down that we had put with a cable attached to an old truck chassis by the side of the field. Floyd is going to try to do what Arthur tells him to do here and uh, this is really hovering practice, control practice of course before going on into free flight. Now here comes one of the very first free flights. Sorry it's light struck, but uh, as Floyd flew around the meadow creeping, as you can see, uh, gradually he would get into the way of the sun early in the day or toward evening. Here's a less light struck shot of the same scene. You can see how he flies around this newly mown uh, field, which was much too small for him really to do any decent exploring of the properties of the helicopter. But right away he found out that he had tremendous stability but not enough controllability that as soon as he flew with any speed, even that uh, uh, walking speed there, the forces tended to rock the bar around and he would have to counteract with his stick. Accordingly, we decided that perhaps the bar should be made to follow the mast a little more rapidly. Here we are measuring, very similar to the work that Art did back in Paoli, and you can see uh, the angle that we go through and then clock, of course, how fast the rotor is following the mast there with a stopwatch. This resulted in our putting dampers on the bar. They were automotive shock absorbers, which we'd found uh, also were manufactured nearby in Buffalo. The, uh, now Floyd is able to fly definitely uh, at reasonable speeds, but actually only up to about 20 miles an hour when he encounters the same violent vibrations at twice per rotor revolution, which Arthur had already uncovered during the hovering with the smoke blowing in the yard months earlier. But the vibrations were so severe we decided that they would definitely stop the project until we did something about it. We decided that the rotor should be stiffer in the cordwise direction. And you'll see here the illustration of a flexible cordwise rotor. Arthur always liked to go back to model work instinctively. Uh, for years after he joined Bell, he continued keeping the model techniques alive as a method of studying problems. We cannot say that this model actually gave us the numerical amount of stiffening of the rotor that was required, but nevertheless, it was a big help. It also showed that we were nowhere near the phenomenon known as ground resonance, which had been plaguing articulated rotors at the time. You'll see as the RPM gets very high here that the model uh, gets fairly wild, but it's a condition under which the uh, main uh, big machine could never operate, way beyond its operating regime. Now, 19 days after we decided to uh, stop flying and go after the problem, we uh, wheel the machine out, just clearing the door there is a mechanism on top of the rotor, which uh, was thought of by Floyd Carlson. And we called it the Swedish yoke in honor of his uh, background having been brought up in the uh, Swedish-American community of Jamestown, New York. At the end of 
the yoke of each blade is a socket, a ball and socket joint. So the blades are still free to change pitch. And as they cone upwards, they stiffen the structure. And the result is that the blades were stiffer in the cordwise direction. And hence the uh, machine could be flown faster than the 20 mile an hour, which had been stopping us before. Still no clutch, but you notice we're very sophisticated in the technique now. Only one man needs to run with the rotor, and away we go. Here we are uh, before a free flight out in the meadow to see how the device works. And uh, of course, we're climbing all over it to make sure all is well after it's done some tie down running. So he gets some fuel put on board and he starts to hover. That's a good illustration of the two control levers, uh, the pump handle collective and the cyclic with the throttle on it. Right away, Floyd was able to fly faster than the 20 miles an hour. So the next stage in the program was to find some place where he would have a little more space because this field in behind the garage was nowhere near big enough to do some really good testing of the machine to find out how fast it would fly and so forth. <coughs> so we put uh, wheels on the machine, which we had previously designed and built and had all prepared, and took off the tie-down outriggers and wheeled the machine behind a car, towing it all the way through Buffalo traffic to a, a little airport known as Military Road Airport on the uh, west side of Buffalo near the river. There it is, and uh, we're about to make forward flight tests. We didn't trust the airspeed system that we had, so we used my car and its speedometer to check the speed of the helicopter. Right away, Floyd found as he flew faster that he required considerably less power. We knew this would be the case, but we didn't know the magnitude. And of course, he was rather embarrassed uh, when he began to fly as high as the treetops without meaning to. Notice the fuel tank there, uh, right behind the transmission. It's a gravity fuel system in this case. Notice also that uh, rear landing gear wheel, which is much too robust. The tail rotor is straight back and very near the ground. Uh, we're going to uh, see much more of those two parts of the helicopter a little bit later. So. Uh, these were our first really free flights. There were a lot of people watching. Arthur Young's dog named Brian got, was the first passenger. He got a ride even though it's supposed to be only a one-place machine. Anyway, back at Gardenville and back at Arthur Young's uh, technique for model work, here we see a U-control model operated by Charlie Siebel, who had joined the project some time before. Uh, this U-control technique had been worked out by Arthur in Paoli, Pennsylvania, long before joining Bell. And we illustrate it here to show two things. One, the fact that uh, these models continue to be a large part of the project. And two, that we're actually measuring the speed power polar. We know the radius. We know the, uh, with a stopwatch the time, so we know the velocity. At the same time, we measure the power of the watt meter, and uh, you can see it being written down over there. And uh, so we know the speed power polar. That's Tom Harriman taking the electrical data. Uh, so we got excellent curves, although they weren't, of course, uh, correct in absolute value. They gave the shape of the speed power polar. And unfortunately, of course, uh, we need some more model blades. But that is a very minor point by this stage. Now, uh, since we were able to get flights up to reasonable speeds, like 70 miles an hour and so forth, we had to dress up the helicopter. Still no clutch, but uh, publicity had already been gotten out. People came in cars to watch what was going on. And uh, Floyd's next question was the good old cocktail hour question, what happens if the engine quits? We had to show auto rotation. Arthur had already shown it in model form to Larry Bell when he had auto rotated a model in the factory uh, and it had landed without power uh, and its cargo was an egg which was not broken. 
but nevertheless in full scale we had to show what would happen and we weren't too successful at first as perhaps uh, this scene uh, forebodes. We towed the helicopter to Gardenville Airport which was much nearer where we were. It was a grass field. Here's the technique of towing uh, down a country road and in the helicopter itself there is both Art Young and Dave Foreman who was the project man assigned by Larry Bell to look over what we were doing. We get to Gardenville Airport and immediately Floyd makes autorotative descents. Here's the first one where he lands with considerable forward speed and a mild flare. He decided he should flare some more in order to kill a lot of that forward speed before touching down. So here he does. And the third time he flares even more. You'll have to look very closely because the camera ran out of film and uh, we had to take the picture on the leader. Now watch extremely closely and you'll see our third attempt that Floyd made. There it is on the leader of the film and pieces are still falling out of the sky as the film proper starts. And there is the wreck. We rushed up to Floyd and said, are you all right? And his answer was yes, God damn it. But uh, of course, right away we started talking about what happened and we saw that a bolt had failed at the bottom of the tail boom attachment, but that the up force on the boom had been much too hard during the flare. There's Arthur lost in thought, uh, thinking, looking the situation over, as Floyd is saying we should have a different landing gear configuration and perhaps raise the tail rotor so that uh, it's possible to land the machine in a flare. Uh, meanwhile, of course, we had lots of outside help because you get consultants uh, creeping out of the woodwork from everywhere to help as soon as you have any trouble. But in spite of that, we were able to hold a meeting more or less right on the spot here. I mentioned that Arthur's agreement with Larry had been that uh, two helicopters should be built and that the second one should be uh, two place, passenger carrying. So uh, we decided the best thing to do would be to finish ship two. It was almost finished as it was and uh, concentrate the flight test efforts on, on the second helicopter. Meanwhile, however, it was surprising how many of the parts of this one could be salvaged. You can see our consultant there sort of won't quit, but that's the way it was. So removing the blades here, tip the machine up and take a look at whether things will still turn. And uh, lo and behold, there was a lot in the transmission that was still okay. The stabilizer bar is a bit bent. The Swedish yoke is the worst for wear. And of course, the tail boom is no longer existent. But you can see the freewheeling still works. Turn the mechanism turns backwards all right. And so forth. This is early September of 1943. It's just three months after our first flights. And we had uh, uh, our second setback.